Uh, Leanne um, and uh, audience, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dan Benjamin, uh, currently resident in, uh, in northern New England and happy to be back and really thankful to Resolve for bringing together so many uh, former colleagues and friends of mine. And uh, uh, I hadn't expected to have uh, so many reunions, but it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here and it, I really applaud the work uh, that Resolve uh, is doing. Let me uh, begin by introducing uh, our panelists. Um, to my near left is uh, General Mike Nagata, an old friend for many years in the, uh, in the government. Um, to his left, he was uh, Lieutenant General and, and I guess most recently Director of Strategic Planning at NCTC. Did they drop the O at some point? No, it's still there. It's still there, okay. Director of Strategic Operational Pr Planning, uh, which I always uh, felt was one of the hardest jobs in the government, actually. Uh, uh, to his left is Robert Fauché, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of uh, Con the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. He's a career Foreign Service Officer and served uh, in many bureaus and in many embassies to his left is um, uh, Mr. Runyon, Christopher Runyon, who is a senior official at USAID working on Africa now and has also had a, uh, a, a long and impressive career in the government working in uh, the development field. And to my far left, uh, physically if not politically, is uh, my old friend Daniel Kimmage, who uh, had the pleasure of working with uh, for many years in government and uh, is the man who, uh, if there's something to know about strategic communications, he's the person you want to ask. And he is currently the deputy coordinator, is that the correct title? Principal deputy coordinator uh, for the Global Engagement uh, Center. So um, by way of a, a brief introduction of myself, I was a coordinator for counterterrorism and set up the first CVE uh, unit in the State Department, uh, and I thought that I would kick this off by uh, venturing a few uh, observations on what has happened uh, in the field, uh, in the policy world, um, since I uh, was sworn in in May of 2009. Um, and I would, um, I, actually I do have to make one uh, apology before that, I just remembered. so. Um, in, in the academy today, I'm at Dartmouth, we all have to sign uh, um, statements that say we will never be on Manel's all-male uh, panels. Um, and so I want to apologize on behalf of USIP for this one and simply uh, point out the important fact that several of these men uh, work for women who declined uh, or could not be president. So um, I think it's an important point. I feel like we should now play the dance of the dinosaurs too, but um, okay. So moving uh, right along, I wanted to uh, just uh, venture a few uh, observations and then throw it open, open, open to our panelists to see if they uh, agree. Um, uh, number one is that um, the first seven or eight years, at least maybe 10 years after 9-11, uh, the discussion about C and now uh, PCVE was largely um, characterized by endless definitional fights. Um, those definitional fights, I am hoping, have receded somewhat. And if they haven't, then I will just start weeping now. Um, number two, uh, when I came into office, my view was that there was a real paucity of uh, good social science on which to base CVE programs. That seems to have changed dramatically in part because of uh, organizations like Resolve and the many member, uh, members of the Resolve network. Um, so there's a lot more social science out there than the question uh, that remains is, is that social science being read and utilized by policymakers. So there are a number of sort of sub-questions there. Is the, uh, is the social science being presented in a way that policymakers with uh, very uh, limited time can understand? Is it being crowded out by uh, what I think many who have served in government would understand as the tyranny of the classified? 
In other words, you, if it's classified, you read it. If it isn't, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and um, then I guess the uh, concomitant question is, one of the problems with getting CVE going was that there were all these different audiences that you had to talk to. Senior uh, officials uh, who um, would all uh, intone, as we heard earlier this morning, we're not going to shoot our way out of this problem, and then would uh, immediately say, no, of course I'm not going to allocate $15 million for your cockamamie idea, um, because uh, they knew that they could never get the metrics or the support on Capitol Hill and because they fundamentally thought that social science was kind of squishy and would never deliver the kind of dramatic results that a good drone strike would. So I am interested to know whether, um, to what extent that has changed. And um, I'm, I'm throwing too much out there. I'll, start, I'll stop with this one. Um, our partners in this world, we tried hard in the Obama administration to put CV on the international agenda through things like the creation of the GCTF and GSURF. And it seems to me that our partners have really um, embraced that and are perhaps less uh, nervous about uh, countering violent extremism or preventing violent extremism, maybe even less squeamish about the notion of the therapeutic as having a role in countering uh, terrorism and violence, extremism, and that we're still a little bit going in circles and that is why we don't have the funding uh, that we might like. But I put a lot on the table and I'm happy to uh, entertain all your thoughts on that and then give you 10 more principles or <laughs> observations. So, uh, who, Mike, you're retired now, right? As of a month and a half ago. Well, mazel tov. And, um, so that means you can speak more freely than our other panelists <laughs> at some peril, but you know, please have at. Well, well, these days the only person I'm worried about getting in trouble with is my wife. Um, but first of all, thank you to uh, USIP, the sponsor of this, of this uh, forum for allowing me to be here today. Um, I'm gonna react to three of the things you just said. Um, I regret to report our definitional debates have not abated. They may not be as numerous or as vociferous as they once were, but uh, there is too much time still being wasted on quite literally dancing on the head of these rhetorical pins. Uh, and we really need to stop it because there's more productive things we could be doing with that time and energy. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of our definitional debates are driven by a, um, a sustained and pernicious uh, degree of ignorance about what it is we are talking about or what it is we are trying to achieve, um, which gets to the next thing I'll react to. Uh, you've talked about social science research. I, I, I would certainly stipulate that whether it's social science or other forms of, uh, of scientific pursuit, that the body of research that has grown, I'll just use the arbitrary date of 9-11. It's not arbitrary for Americans, but it is utterly arbitrary for everybody else in the world. Um, it is inarguably larger than it once was, but I think my personal opinion is that's the wrong measurement to, to take satisfaction that the volume of research is larger than it once was because the scale of terrorism today is much larger than it once was, so I would argue that the gap between the research we need for an ever-growing and diversifying problem versus the scale of what we have, that delta is, continues to grow. Uh, we, we are not keeping up with the need for research. We are falling behind the need for research because the scale of the problem keeps growing. Um, now, why is that so? Well, you've already, in, in many ways, described it. It's an absence of policy seriousness. Uh, I, for some of those of you in the room who know my background, I'm a special forces officer by background. I have literally spent 20 years of my life uh, utilizing physical violence to deal with terrorists. And after 20 years of not seeing my family for more than half that time, I regret to report there are more terrorists now than when I started. So I've lived the dream or the nightmare of, of realizing that 
while I would certainly argue that when lives were on the line or a hostage needed to be rescued, that the use of violence was necessary, but it is strategically and clearly inadequate to solving the problem we have because we've got more terrorists now, despite all our strength, the strengths we developed in the use of physical force. Um, the third thing I'll just react to is, uh, is really just the, the reverse side of the coin I've just described. What would it take? It would take, I do not believe it would take the kind of resourcing or manpower that um, whether it is military forces or intelligence agencies have, uh, have been lavished with, particularly inside the United States since 9-11. I don't think the absorptive capacity exists in the terrorism prevention and CVE world. But most importantly, because of this absence of research or sufficient research, I should say, I want to give credit where credit is due. There are incredibly courageous researchers all over the world trying their best to do this. But what they really suffer from is, a, is inconsistent or non-existent policy support. Um, it is very popular and to a degree necessary that politicians everywhere speak strongly, consistently, and then match their rhetoric with legislative or policy action to support the use of kinetic forms of counterterrorism. If you try to do a count of what the volume is of similar kinds of political rhetoric, rhetoric to support things like counter messaging or terrorism prevention or CVE or what have you, it is a tiny fraction of what you see in the other realm of counterterrorism. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to try to pick myself off the floor now. And uh, Robert, do you, what would you like to uh, comment among that smorgasbord of different uh, of, uh, observations? Well, again, thank you, and thank uh, USIP for organizing this uh, conference. And I, I do apologize. I know my assistant secretary wishes she were here. I know you regret that I'm not the assistant secretary, but please know I regret I'm not the assistant secretary too. <laughs> so. um, I have to say, uh, I would agree with those comments for the most part, but I think in CSO, we are working hard to provide policy support in this field and to develop what I believe are some of the most important ideas of how we apply the research that is out there. There is a lot of research and our team is looking at it, bringing it together and trying to figure out what's the best way to apply this to the local situations that we're confronting. Now we're a small, um, small organization and there's not a lot we can do, but we're looking at specific models, specific places to see are there things we can do by establishing our baseline studies on this situation there, looking for indicators, and then devising or helping to devise locally some kinds of strategies to address uh, violent extremism. And I think that is really the future of this field in terms of the work we're going to be doing. It is not, there is no kinetic solution, as you said. It, it cannot be. It has to be a political solution, and it has to be locally driven and locally supported, or it will fail. And that is what we are focused on at CSO, trying to find those, those opportunities, trying to, tr you know, try different approaches in different places and learning from those lessons and doing this through a whole of government approach. It is not just the State Department, it's the State Department working with our colleagues at DOD, at USAID, in the field, on these problems and partnering with the local authorities to see if we can come up with solutions that they think will approach or will address the, uh, the threat that they're facing from violent extremism. So I think that is, uh, for us, the way forward. It doesn't take a lot of money, but it does take support on the Hill and other places uh, to, to understand that this is a long, slow process. It is not a quick solution, um, but it's one that you have to sustain and move forward on in order to be able to claim any kind of success. Uh, we're now at 18 years since 9-11. 18 years from now, I think we could be in a much better place if we continue with this process and expand it and broaden it to other parts of the world. So that's encouraging, thank you. Can I just press you a little and, and, and you can make this sign if you don't like it, but can I press you a little on the, since CSO is at the center of this world now, of the nexus with social science and, um, and the policy world? 
I'm sorry, your the nexus of social science with the policy world. Do you feel that uh, the U.S. government is getting the social science it needs, able to digest it, um, and to turn it into uh, effective policy? I, I would say, to an extent, yes. That we are getting the research we need, but there's always a need for more. And you know, as a consumer, we will always want more. Um, are we able to turn it into effective policy is the real question. And uh, that is what we, we're doing with our various projects, but not on a large enough scale is what I would argue. We need more resources, especially personnel, to be able to do that. And we are working at the same time on how do we evaluate the effectiveness of these programs and the, those kind of indicators of effectiveness, can they have more of a universal application than just in specific locales and that sort of thing. And again, I think as we uh, do more of this work and develop these concepts more broadly and deeply, we'll find the lessons that will be have, uh, will have greater and more universal application. Christopher. Thanks. Um, I think you threw out at least six questions. I will try to address five of them and the last I will not for personal employment reasons. Um, but I would, I just, I just wanted to say, you know, in this room we've got a lot of, of, of research heroes who have done some amazing and pioneering work that I know that USAID and the rest of the US government has taken advantage of. We also have some policy heroes, so I did just want to give a shout out to both Dan and to Mike. Um, uh, when I was at State Department, I really admired Dan's amazing work at CT during a tough time. And then uh, with General Nagata, um, I witnessed you in the Situation Room in the White House do some pretty brave things to stand up for smart strategy and good policy. So just a shout out to those guys. You'll notice we're both out of government now. On on definitional fights, yeah, but I do think that that's better. I really do. Uh, I, I really do. Um, and uh, perhaps an example of that is the fact that uh, we're in our second, perhaps third iteration of policy, even within USAID, which meant we had to settle on taxonomy and we had to look and talk with a lot of people to make sure we were using uh, that stuff. And, and I would just say on policy, you know, in 2011, we put a policy out, the development response to extremism and insurgency. Uh, which was a pretty important document for us that shaped a lot of our thinking and it really came out of a lot of the Iraq and Afghanistan experiences. Um, that's now being adjusted to be more direct in that it is uh, more geographically uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, oriented to places that we know are of specific CVE vulnerability or direct threat. Um, it's more uh, focused and, and more CVE specific as opposed to the concerns that we all had about attribution uh, and sort of uh, saying, well, a program's got this connection, but there wasn't the data behind, behind it. There wasn't the research behind it. Uh, and the third component of that is measurability uh, and making sure that there is data that backs it up. Our taxpayers deserve it. Congress is asking for it. Uh, our leadership is the new administration presently is asking for that. And so we're using a more tailored definition uh, of, of our ex a response to, to extremism and how we know that our programming is working. And then the last is one that I think is uh, uh, um, really about self-reliance and about local capacity. And we're trying to make that more a centerpiece of, of our strategy and our approach and measuring that to make sure that it's not just that the problem went away, well, maybe the problem went away temporarily, but is the local capacity there to keep that um, in a sustainable situation going forward? And just one plug, uh, our hope is that that strategy is available for public comment on the USAID website in a, in a week or so. So uh, especially for, for all the, the folks in the room who are either practitioners or researchers, we'd love to get your feedback on that when it does come out. Um, on, are we using the research? Absolutely. Um, not only are we funding it, um, I including, I'm, I'm proud to say, my bureau in Africa helping to support Resolve, but we're using those publications, whether that's, uh, you know, the, the Governance Nexus pub out of Resolve, which has been very, very helpful, the secondary source uh, research. Uh, and a lot of our programming has also uh, conducted research as either a prequel to actual on-the-ground activities or have tried to embed research components in the activities while we go along. 
Uh, that said, boy, do I wish that we had a deployable battalion of PhD candidates who could embed with a lot of our implementing partners to be able to real-time pick up data while at the same time we're trying out and experimenting uh, with, with activities. Um, so I think uh, that's probably about it. Classification, yeah, still a challenge. Uh, you know, when you have to walk down hallways to get into safes, to pick out hard drives, to boot up computers, you're just not going to have people connected the way the interagency probably does need to be connected on this, let alone with research, um, especially when that's funded perhaps by, you know, intelligence community organizations or others where it's even further siloed. Um, and then on resources, uh, yeah, we're still struggling with resources. Uh, we've tried this, 1207 we've seen, CTPF we've seen. There are all these others uh, out there. We know we've got some support, but somehow we have not been able to crack that, that nut. Thanks. Daniel. So the virtue of going last is I've now forgotten all the questions, um, uh, but we seem to be starting with a bit of a baseline exercise in tallying up positives and negatives. So I'll start with what I think are some positive developments and move on to some that are a little less positive. I would definitely flag as a positive that on the definitional side, I recall 10 to 15 years ago, a huge amount of energy expended on largely fruitless polemics over monocausal explanations. It's ideology, it's poverty, it's grievances. And those seem to have subsided. There are some outliers out there still advocating these, but largely thanks to the efforts of the research community, we have come to an acceptance that there are much more complicated factors in human behavior. Um, this leads to a bit of a negative because it would have been uh, much simpler had there been a monocausal explanation. We would design programming around it. We would be well on our way to solving the problem, but since we're dealing with people in the infinite number of motivations they have, we've come to this very uh, complex place. So that, that leads me to the second development, which is the, the, the genuine uh, profusion of uh, research. And I think that here other uh, panelists have discussed this. We confront at the Global Engagement Center uh, uh, what I think is a good problem to have, but still a problem, in that it is challenging to simply follow all of the research. We have someone uh, in our office who follows this uh, full time. She's constantly uh, sending around summaries of the research, but we struggle to make sure that this is integrated into our programs. That said, this is uh, a much better place to be in than we were in 10 years ago. On the issue of uh, research, I sense and I'd actually be curious to hear from some of the folks here that we still face the problem that Mark Sageman outlined in a very uh, famous paper where he said, government has reams and reams of information that it keeps to itself, but tends to exploit only to uncover new plots and look for threats. And he characterized this as government knows everything but understands nothing. The research community, he said, has all of the intellectual firepower and the time to really understand what's going on, but it lacks this more granular information that's locked away in government vaults. He, he characterized this somewhat uncharitably as the research community understands everything but knows nothing. And, and we, I think, have really not made as much progress as we should in bringing this together and making more information available. I'm hoping as time goes by and there are you know, now decades separating us from the inception that more of this will um, uh, come out and become part of the public realm. Lastly, I would flag as an uncertain development that we're having this conversation in a vastly different policy context than we did when counterterrorism was unquestionably at the top of the agenda. Now, if you just look at the headlines, there are issues of geopolitical competition that have really superseded counterterrorism. Counterterrorism hasn't gone away, but it is one of several competing priorities. And it's unclear to me what effect that will have on the uh, current levels of activity. My hope, obviously, is that we don't lose momentum that we have built up, particularly on the research side and the interaction of that research with some of the programmatic. So that's uh, my preliminary balance sheet. Well, very good. So um, that's all very helpful. One uh, issue I want to revert to, which uh, General Nagata brought up, um, underscores kind of a big paradox in the in the situation which is that um, we don't have uh, we don't have a global census of uh, violent extremists uh, 
but we know that there are a lot more of them than there were uh, not too long ago. Uh, and yet um, that has not really dramatically moved the needle on government interest, US government interest uh, in the social science, in uh, uh, CVE, PVE approaches uh, to violent extremism. And it would seem like the obvious answer is because uh, the kinetic approach uh, did a good enough job in dealing with uh, the imminent, so we'll let the urgent just languish. Um, do any of your uh, current former masters, and I won't ask you to name them, have a consciousness of this growth uh, in numbers and how the environment seems to be changing? Um, some do, um, but I would argue it is an insufficient number of senior policymakers, not just in our own government, but around the world, recognize or, or, or have been able to grasp the, the reality that um, the use of physical force against terrorism, necessary though it may be, as I indicated earlier, when lives are on the line, um, it is strategically insufficient uh, for the simple reason that you've already cited. I mentioned it when I made my remarks. There, there were inarguably more terrorists now than there were 18 years ago. Um, not just more, but the diversification of, of terrorism is extraordinary. Um, but um, why? Why has it failed to grasp sufficient policy make, <clears throat> maker attention so that we can make the, what I would argue are the necessary investments and frankly the necessary priority shifts towards methods of combating terrorism that don't involve force. Um, I think a lot of the explanation is well known to this audience. I, I, I think you and I have even talked about this on one or two occasions when we were still in government that um, particularly in the kinds of governments we have the political event, event horizon of any particular policymaker is measured in a few short years. Well, the use of violence can deliver satisfaction for a few short years until, of course, the, the, the phenomenon we're struggling against morphs in a direction that we didn't expect and rebounds. Um, one need no, look no farther than the fact that we thought we won against Al-Qaeda in Iraq only to have it morph into a much more virulent form of terrorism uh, that we now call the Islamic State. But for the policymakers at the time, they drew enormous satisfaction from the notion that we, we have strategically defeated AQI. You know, t you know roll, out the, roll out the brass band, have the victory parade, it's all over. What we didn't realize is it wasn't over. There were some people telling us it wasn't over, but we didn't listen. Uh, so that's one reason. The only other reason I think worth mentioning is, uh, at the risk of sounding like I'm venturing into arenas I have no expertise, um, the, I've read over the years several different versions of an of a old psychological truth. People hate uncertainty. Uh, they love certainty. Matter of fact, I've, I even heard one psychologist say, people will choose a unpleasant certainty before they choose complete uncertainty. Um, now, why am I mentioning that? Because there is nothing more uncertain today than how to prevent large numbers of people from becoming terrorists. The, the journey from a reasonably normal citizen to someday becoming a violent extremism, the solutions for that are very uncertain right now. Dropping a 500 pound bomb delivers nothing but certainty. You either you know you killed that person or you didn't. Which is why, just as a matter of human nature, people tend to gravitate towards what they can tangibly measure, see, and feel, vice the uncertainty of how do you prevent someone from becoming an extremist. Anyone else want to comment on uh, that? I'll, I'll venture something. Um, you know, this paradox here, I think even as we have deepened our understanding of what I would describe as the very local dynamics of terrorism down to the kind of personal dynamics of groups, there has been a phenomenon uh, 
in, in, the, in the broader context that is in the exact opposite direction, which is terrorist organizations, small clandestine terrorist organizations, latching on sort of lamprey-like to insurgencies, which are large and public. And the tools that, that we use to counter recruitment and radicalization at the local level informed by research, those are entirely different from the tools that you use to counter an insurgency, which takes root in a political context that requires a completely different set of, of, of policy solutions, different parts of government deal with that. Um, it is often intractably difficult. It's embedded in regional and uh, geostrategic uh, uh, contexts that are extremely tough to get at. So I, I think this has been one of the conundrums we've grappled with over the last decade, is that even as we've deepened our understanding of what I describe as the micro level, of terrorism at the macro level, it is now intertwined with insurgencies in a number of theaters that require a much different and, and more complex uh, toolbox to deal with. So I would, I think it's a really important point. I would contend that it's always been uh, intertwined with insurgencies, whether in the Caucasus or Kashmir or where have you. Uh, what um, is different is that <laughs> there are just so many more now. Uh, and uh, you know so many states teetering on on failure or failed and and so on and so forth. Um, Christopher, I know you you are holding your mic as though you want to say something. So I want to ask you uh, to answer this question, but also uh, another question, which I think is is good for Robert as well. And that is, um, we have heard a lot today uh, of uh, really uh, interesting and impressive work that points to the need for hugely specific localized knowledge and the understanding that every context is radically different. Uh, the US government is, you know, one of the world's largest organizations and, you know, by definition has a hard time with that. And I am curious to hear if um, you think that um, we are nonetheless evolving new ways of dealing with uh, those kind of radical specificities, and uh, are you optimistic about continued progress in that direction? Uh, thank you. Um, so for the earlier questions, yeah, we are stretched. The number of contexts that we're working in, we weren't having these conversations about Mozambique 10 years ago. Um, we weren't talking about Tanzania the way we're talking about Tanzania. Um, uh, and I, I really like Dan's point. I just wanted to build off of that. I mean, I just today was reading a little bit more about, you know, 30 ISIS guys come back from the Middle East, go to the Philippines, whip up in alignment, what was your, your, your analogy there, but leech on to the local insurgency. Yeah, lamprey, right. And, and the next thing you know, we have 1,000 people. Uh, if that's ISIS 3.0, uh, we have a whole different set of uh, cross-disciplinary uh, things that need to fuse quite quickly, and I think the, the resource needs are going to be very different for that type of a fight. Um, uh, on complexity, I, I think that's a, a, another really, really important point. Uh, we are leaning into complexity. Our new strategy will embrace that, and on hyper-localization, that is absolutely critical. As you can imagine, the transaction costs for hyper-localization are a lot higher when you're doing a large portfolio of activities than if you just walk in the room and say, there's the problem, go fix that one driver or go fix that one problem. So we are wrestling with that. But the good news is, at least for me, culturally, coming from a development organization, I mean, it's malpractice in our business if you aren't using extremely local information and you get out there and you find out what's going on in that village. Not that village, not that village, that village. And the differences between those are so terribly important on terrain and understanding that terrain and turning that into good project designs and good interventions that try to have a CVE impact. Um, one other thing I did want to say was you know, we started to allude to like the, the terrorist criminal nexus. Uh, that haunts my dreams a bit um, uh, because of these shifting loyalties and allegiances and the commercial aspect of things. We'd love more and more research on that. Um, uh, and and I, 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 right now I'm, I'm finally getting to the Kilcullen book, which talks about the, the, the Out of the Mountains book, which is, talks about competitive control. 
And I think there's a whole thing there that I think would be very useful for researchers to read just as a construct for how we try to respond to the challenges uh, of governance in the absence or the presence of state and how that uh, uh, becomes a rational choice for local people. Uh, we talked about that during counterinsurgency work. Somehow we need to go back and read that chapter again now in a, in a terrorism or extremism uh, mindset. And then one other thing I would just plug would be, on, I think there are some mega trends here. And if we're gonna skate to where the puck is going to be a little bit more, uh, you know, what is, what is a continued rapid urbanization gonna bring us? What are climate changes gonna do with regards to people's uh, uh, state society relationships? Uh, what are some of the water scarcity problems going to do? What, what is 5G terrorism going to look like? Uh, and, and I think for a development organization trying desperately to take the long view um, uh, in a sort of gradual but deliberate and sustained response, those are the things that I think are particularly important for us, both for researchers and then certainly on the, on the practitioner side. Well, I was going to say I'm an optimist, but after hearing that, <laughs> I know it. I'm the, I'm the yeah. Just for that, it was a buzzkill. Are you know that? What I w what I would say, though, I, I would agree with every, those comments, especially the idea that we have to have kind of the local connection. I, I, I was familiar with the Resolve curriculum and how you're trying to do capacity building of researchers at the local level. This is hugely important. This will pay the kind of dividends and provide the kind of research that we really need and that we can try to get access to. This is, uh, for me, one of the mo most important sort of kind of projects that we're, go we're pursuing right now. But at the same time, I would say within the government approach and what we're looking at for the United States government, and why I do have somewhat of a cause for optimism. I see policy development here that's responding to this in a way that's not kinetic. That is saying there are aspects to the violent extremism problem that we have to address in different manners and in different ways. So for example, we have the stabilization and assistance review, looking at how we can do stabilization better um, as a, a whole of government approach, but at the local level and try different things. We have 11, countries right now that we're focused on, we're going to see what's going to happen there, and learn the lessons from that and apply it in other places. We have the Eli Wiesel Atrocity and Prevention, uh, Genocide and Prevention Act, and, and essentially under that, we are going to be identifying countries that are at risk of, or even sub-regions at risk for atrocity, and try to come up with strategies to address the risks that are there. Those strategies, just as they are in the SAR, will have CVE elements. They have to have that and address CVV, CVE aspects. We have the Women, Peace, and Security Act and the strategy that we're implementing now that um, completely integrates women and women's issues and uh, peace and security issues into CVE um, to make sure that we have you know, real progress, again, uh, at all levels and recognizing that without WPS being addressed as part, or CVE being addressed as part of WPS, there will be no real progress. Um, and lastly, let me just mention fragility, which seems to be one of the big themes of the day right now. We are working with USIP on a fragility project in Burkina Faso, just a pilot project to see how we can identify uh, the indicators and come up with strategies to address fragility that might give grounds to violent extremism. Um, this is a small project, but it's a pilot project to try to figure out lessons, again, that will have greater application. This is important because we, we fully anticipate the Global Fragility Act will be passed, and we need to know how we're going to respond to that. That is a you know, $1.15 billion over the next five years on fragility, and that is really about addressing uh, the CVE indicators as an aspect of our fragility approaches. And all of this put together shows that we have a lot of different approaches to the CVE problem filtering through or integrated into, woven into various policy approaches and programmatic approaches by state, by USAID, and DOD. Okay, now I'm going to ask a, a question that may make those who are uh, still in office squirm a bit. And so I'll focus it more on, on uh, Mike. Um, and anyone else who wants to can chime in. So, um, you know, it was, uh, and, I, and 
you know, being fully candid, it was my understanding back when I was in government that, you know, it, that localization was hugely important, but there was also a really important dimension uh, at the highest level of government to government uh, interaction. And there was a discussion earlier today about dealing with bad partners. Um, you know, we have countries that we are, uh, that we have uh, serious relationships with uh, that either um, uh, do um, really bad things uh, in the name of counterterrorism. What? Uh, or, <laughs> he used to always feign that kind of thing in the, <laughs> in the situation room too. It took us forever. Um, uh, or that simply can't be bothered, for example, to um, uh, deal with, you know, the, the very legitimate grievances having to do with lack of uh, the provision of justice and, and, and those sorts of things, which are a major yeah. driver, I think we all agree. And I guess the question is, um, from those of us who just read the newspaper, it would seem like there isn't a lot going on at that level of government at the moment uh, in, uh, you know, bilateral relations or multilateral fora but there is a huge government below that that does work on mm -hmm. issues like this, and I'm curious if you think that the, the torch is still lit. It is. There are still extraordinary people in all the agencies of the government that I used to work with that are, are striving mightily, and in some cases courageously, because they're potentially putting their own careers at risk, to make the case, to make the argument that we have to shift our policy formulations and our strategic thinking towards those things that are more likely to lead to long-term strategic success as opposed to short-term, I feel better because this guy's now dead or in jail. Um, and, and, and I have complete confidence that that, that mass of people uh, from junior officials all the way to pretty senior officials will continue to strive in that direction. Um, but at the, at the top layer of the policy, and, and I'm, I'll, I won't restrict this to the United States government, I see this in many governments, at the top levels of many of the governments that I've interacted with over the, over the years, there is a reluctance to follow that course. Uh, there are exceptions to this. There, there are some very senior policymakers I know both in the United States and around the world who are also striving in this direction, but they, there's, no, the, there's an insufficient mass of them. The, they, they, are, they are outnumbered by those who are either oblivious of the need to make this change or are very reluctant, highly resistant in some cases to making this change. Now having said that, I, I, it should beg the question why, so I'll try to be brief about this. One reason is because of what I've already mentioned. It's, the ways in which we can successfully employ these other instruments, these other instrumentalities, fill these decision makers with uncertainty, whereas they know they can watch the IRSR feed of a kinetic strike. That's nothing but certainty. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other reasons as well. Um, one of them is that we've got some very unfortunate habits. Um, it was, my colleague just mentioned the uh, um, billion and a half dollars, I think it was, will be invested over, sev over several years. I'm glad that's going to happen. I'm delighted that's going to happen. But it, it, as soon as I, th I heard that, I thought about uh, the fact that my office, for the, my last three years, I was charged with doing an empirical analysis of how the United States government spends counterterrorism money annually. That's actually a, 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 a perennial requirement of the National Counterterrorism Center. I can't quote any specific numbers here because the report is classified, but I doubt it will shock any of you to know that um, the, we spend tens, multiple tens of billions of dollars each year on kinetic counterterrorism. Now, I'm not saying we should throw that kind of money at CVE or counter messaging. I don't think they have the absorptive capacity and money isn't necessarily the solution to all their problems, but when I examine the enormous disparity between how we resource kinetic CT vice everything else, that can't possibly be the right answer. But that's not part of our policy budgetary formulation habit. Our habit, it's almost on autopilot, is to throw the lion's share of the checkbook at people like I used to be, 
who go on raids, who use physical force, or who arrest people. We have got to, you know, and, but as everyone here knows, nothing is harder than changing your habits. But if you never start, you never finish. I would just say two things uh, to that. There are many people uh, in our political leadership who believe that every time they face these problems, there is the kinetic solution, or there's the solution of just throwing money. And they, you know, we, we, we're, we're whiplashed back and forth between these two all the time. I think what we're trying to do now is just develop a smarter approach. And it means, yes, there is times when you have to have a violent solution, and there are times when doing something much softer is much better for a longer-term solution. And trying to be smart about that and helping our political leadership understand why this is a better approach in this circumstance at this time is really the challenge for all of us. And that's what we're trying to do. Can I riff off of that? Um, I, I have even lower expectations. Um, <laughs> It's a race to the bottom here. <laughs> I, I would just, I dream of just not continuing to do stupid things. Um, and so m if you look at some of the research, uh, you know, I think for us, w there were some ripples that went through the policy world, at least uh, in my circles, when the UNDP report, uh, The Road to Extremism, came out, which, you know, cited how approximately 71% of those who made the tipping point from anger to taking acts of physical violence uh, in Africa, did so because of negative uh, interactions with security forces of their host country government. Um, I, I think that we've, we've got to start there uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, you know, some of these grievances are, are very legitimate um, and fuel the problem. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes in our rush to quote unquote partner, um, we get ourselves into mortgages that are quite difficult to get out of. Um, and I think it creates risk and um, association problems for the United States later down the road. Um, and I say that because often it is later uh, when we are asked to help fix the situation and it is, it is a, a one of structural violence that has impacted the community. Um, I did a, a good chunk of my graduate research in Uzbekistan. I was just thinking about this. I don't know why, but Uzbekistan came to my mind because here's, a, here's another situation where you had a legacy of repressive, terrible governance. Then it flipped, and we're still dealing with that aftershock, and we will be for quite a while. Uh, the trauma issue that had come up earlier in the earlier sessions, I think that uh, uh, wrestling with that, we should have known better uh, that to be uh, in relationships with governments that were structurally repressive uh, was going to have after effects which would impact foreign fighting and other kinds of problems like that. And then the last, just because it's not classified, uh, we attribute approximately 85, sometimes north of 100, 120 million or so uh, dollars per year over the last three or four years uh, to what we would call CVE. So that's about the level of investment um, when you compare that with some of the other agency things. Uh, Daniel, I have a question specifically for you. Um, <clears throat> when, um, uh, uh, when I was in government, I, I was always uh, troubled by the extent to which um, uh, some of my superiors uh, in various buildings uh, were convinced that if we just got the messaging right, we would crack this nut open. It's all on you, man. Um, and I wasn't really persuaded, but somehow I got involved in doing an awful lot of work on messaging. And I think that uh, the, the, the message, if you will, that we got uh, throughout a lot of today was that, um, you know, messages on the airwaves from uh, distant unknown sources of uh, dubious provenance uh, are not going to solve this uh, for us. But the, the question for you is, um, I'm pretty sure you think that. Do we st are we going to still continue to always have that 
uh, decision maker who thinks, if God damn, if I just hired the right people to get that message right, is that going to be um, our, our fate forever? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't want to uh, fall into a uh, paroxysm of pessimism here, so I'm going to say no, I don't think so. You know, there is this, you can call it the, the abracadabra solution, or I think of it the war game solution, where the bad tweets are rising on this side of the screen, the good tweets will rise to meet them, and somehow the problem will be solved in a couple of pixelated bursts in the middle. Um, you know, that's pretty obviously nonsense. Uh, what you know, I think I'm not, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here. I think we all understand this. I would actually attribute some of this to an early spate of obsessive focus on the messaging genius of Al-Qaeda. We saw, we've all forgotten about this because the most recent obsessive focus was on the messaging genius of ISIS as compared to Zawahiri, you know, stodgy sitting in a cave still. But, you know, if you read some of the analyses from 2004, I think those resonated with senior policymakers more than many of us realized at the time. And there was this sense that, wow, these guys have really cracked the code on a magic way. You know, I once was giving uh, a presentation and joked about, you know, the Al-Qaeda website with the button to donate and, you know, the person I was briefing said, wow, you know, we've got to stop that, you know. I mean, th there were some very uh, simplified understandings of how this worked. You know, what I would say in, in, in closing on this, we have really moved away from looking at this through a messaging prism. We have moved away from looking at the solution through messaging. We very rarely use the term. I'm using it here because that's how you framed the question. But this is not about messaging. It is about influence. It is about behavior. And messaging is one component. It is often the most visible component. It is often the one that attracts the most attention because you know, it's something that is relatively easy to talk about. You can see it. It often intertwines with technology, where a technology-obsessed society. We love talking about the latest uh, platforms. But those of us who have done very in-depth research on this realize it is simply one component. I would say broadly, we, you know, at the Global Engagement Center, recognize that it's simply one component and we've moved very considerably away from the idea of messaging being the core and we constantly push back at the idea that we are a messaging shop or that you're going to have this problem and let's bring in the messaging guys at the end. That's just not how it works. See, I knew we'd find something reassuring. Um, so uh, I, I want to throw it open now and just ask if there are any trends, uh, any developments from our partners, uh, you know, we, co we cooperate closely with quite a lot of countries on uh, PCVE, uh, on, um, on influence, on a lot of different things. If there are any noteworthy trends that you would want to call out uh, right now, um, for those of us in the, you know, in the veil of ignorance that is the private sector, you know, it, it, it would be enlightening. I'll mention one. Um, there's a personal opinion. I suppose some people in the audience may think I'm full of crap here, but I, I think a global trend is a um, a very rapidly, to one degree changing, to another degree deteriorating, relationship between populations everywhere and their governments. Some of this change is necessary and beneficial. A lot of it, though, is a, is a, is a loss of confidence. I, everywhere I've been for the last, particularly the last 20 years, but really over my whole entire career, I've seen this. I, I, did, it, I, didn't, I didn't always recognize it. I've only come to recognize it perhaps in the last decade. But, and I'd rather, obviously, I'm going to focus before I finish on the deterioration aspect of this. Not all of it is deterioration, but a big chunk of it is. Everywhere this relationship is deteriorating, and I do believe it is a global trend, so it's consistent with your question. Um, this is, this creates, everywhere I look, is translates into a rich growth medium for violent extremism, which is why, I, I think this is a very large part of the explanation why, as I stipulated at the outset, there are more terrorists now than there have ever been. Anyone else? Maybe just, this is a bit parochial to my world, but 
I think that amongst the development people who have been asked to rise to this challenge, um, there's a fairly high degree of consensus across countries. So the donor coordination angle of this is easier um, and it's led to a lot of blended funding, co-designed projects, uh, shared data, um, and other things like that that I think are very valuable. Um, so that I think it's just something I wanted to point out. Yeah. Let me just uh, uh, reinforce that, you know, here at USIP earlier this year, we had a meeting of the uh, communications working group in the counter ISIS coalition. And, you know, one of the few silver linings to the dark cloud that was uh, uh, ISIS is the degree of uh, international cooperation uh, around the issue, and that continues, and that's, I, I think, you know, much, it's in a much better place than it was 10 years ago. I know that we interact with many more countries, and we benefit from their uh, kind of shared experience in this area. If I could add just one thing. I, I, I would agree there, there is concern about the, this deterioration of this, you know, uh, this disconnection of people from the government. It, it really is troubling. Um, at the same time, uh, I think back to one of our projects in Kenya, and I don't know if Dr. Natalia had talked about this earlier, but we, we took an approach after the Westlake Mall terrorism attack where we saw that seemed to drive people towards more violent extremist kind of opinion and attitude of working in a different area uh, in Kenya with the local government to improve the relationship between the local population and the security forces that were there. And this came about uh, after about five and a half years, there was another attack, it was the, um, I want to say the, uh, what was it, Dusitu or whatever? Just a two uh, attack. And what we saw after that was actual, what I thought was progress, in the sense that there, while people were appalled by the attack, you didn't have the same kind of reaction of people moving towards a more kind of extreme kind of approach, lo looking towards violence as the way to resolve this. The security forces didn't kind of engender that. And I think it's an important model for us all um, to look at. And what I found especially interesting on this case was that our international partners were looking at it in the same way and looking, saying this is something we can draw from and learn from. And we seem to be having much more conversation and dialogue along those lines. Uh, sticking with the issue of our partners, uh, Daniel made an important point that, you know, we are shifting paradigms and focusing more on great power uh, and near peer competition. Um, and so, you know, there may, we may see a dialing back of resources both uh, on the kinetic side but also on the, on the softer side. And so I guess the question is, uh, is that detectable among uh, our, our partners, especially those in Europe who have, have really put out quite a lot of money for uh, uh, P and, and CVE work? You know, I, I don't know that it's immediately uh, uh, detectable. I can't speak to the, 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 the budget figures. Uh, we're definitely having a more complex conversation than we we're having. And this is particularly apparent at the Global Engagement Center because Congress specifically broadened our mission starting in 2017 to deal with propaganda and disinformation by state and non-state actors. So what had been a focus on non-state actors, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, very quickly became a focus on Russia, China, Iran. Um, I, I would flag one potential benefit to the CVE effort from the renewed focus on uh, nation states and great power competition. If you look at the history of our Cold War standoff, you know, there was an enormous you know, uh, 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 component of it that consisted of the information space. And that was because the cost of direct military confrontation was so astronomically high that we were forced to operate much more in the realm of propaganda, counter-propaganda, and, and, and we made very considerable investments in those areas. Our hands were much less tied in the counterterrorism sphere. It often unfolded in areas where we could do things that you cannot do against a nation state. Now that we are looking once again at competition between nation states, you know, nuclear powers, 
a lot of this is once again going to unfold in the information space. And I think that that could lead to, I, I, I think, you know, if you just look at some of the recent congressional legislation in, uh, you know, countering Russian uh, malign influence, the amounts are pretty significant, you know, compared to some of the things we were talking about in the CVE space. So I think that, you know, we are going to be working at a larger scale, and certainly we're dealing with actors that are working at a large scale. Paradoxically, I think that could end up benefiting the CVE community down the line. I would at some point like to have a discussion about how do we transfer some of the lessons we learned from CVE in the last 10, 15 years to these more recent areas of kind of great power competition. But I think that there's, there, there's more interplay between this and we're just starting to explore it. I'll take a shot at that. I brought so much, so much uh, sunshine to this panel with my optimism. But if, if you looked at a, if you, if you look at, you know, gray warfare and perhaps some of these new rules of the game as part of great power competition, it's hard for me not to believe that uh, uh, great powers will use proxies, and great powers will arm those proxies, and those proxies will use violence, and some of those proxies will look different than the types of groups that we're typical uh, in engaging. Uh, and I think it, the violent extremist organizations are absolutely within the food groups that they will look at to take advantage of or to distract or to consume uh, any nation's resources that they're going up against. Uh, so for me, and based on what Dana just said, I mean, not only the knowledge management from all of that prior work, but to be honest, break out the microfiche from the Cold War uh, and take a look at some of that, um, because I think we will be dealing with some of those types of issues going forward, but they will be nastier and perhaps more lethal. I, I would just say not just the microfiche, I would recommend to everyone the uh, miniseries Carlos, which is a great depiction <laughs> of the uh, Soviet Union's uh, in involvement with some of the terrorist groups yeah. in the Cold War era. I, I want to express my dubiousness at the idea we're going to pivot away from counterterrorism, and I'm not just saying that because I spent my career doing it. Um, I've, I've seen us try to, quote, pivot away from terrorism on multiple occasions. It's We're still never... pivoting towards the Far East. We've been doing right. that for about five years well, now. Actually, when I was on the joint staff, the joke was our pivot to Asia was a 360-degree pivot. <laughs> <laughs> we, we ended up right, right back where we started. But there, there, I think there are, good, there are important reasons why um, we, we, well, policymakers can't take their eye off this ball. One is because of the political harm terrorism does. And there's nothing more finely tuned than a politician's ability to sense unfavorable changes in, the, in his, his or her political fortunes. As you know very well, terrorism is the use of violence to cause political change. But more importantly, um, I think the, a better characterization is we clearly are going to have to increase our, our effectiveness against peer competitors and the like but partially for the reasons it was just described, groups, non-state actors, that somebody's gonna call a terrorist group are gonna be increasingly attractive proxies for everybody, including the United States. So that's one reason why terrorism is gonna go away. But I think the most important reason is because when an act of violence occurs that has political reverberations, which again is the goal of any terrorist, um, it, is, it becomes politically untenable for any government that is suffering the consequences of it not to throw resources at it. I mean, I remember before Benghazi, we were in the special operations world, we were pulling people out of North Africa until Benghazi happened and then everybody had to turn around and go right back. They're still there in large measure. So it's not really not a pivot. It's never gonna be a pivot. We do have to increase our efforts against these other problems, but we're never gonna pivot away from terrorism. Uh, Christopher, can I f just follow up? Um, maybe, um, uh, I don't know if you're up, up to speed on this stuff, but are your colleagues, your opposite numbers in uh, the world's leading uh, development agencies uh, sticking with the, with the CVE mission or as defense budgets are going up around the world, uh, are, they, are they moving, are governments moving resources in that direction? Do you have a sense of which way the wind is blowing? Yeah, um, I, I, I think, again, this has been a hard-fought consensus. Um, and I think for a lot of other political reasons over the last 15, 20 years, um, 
it's been hard for some countries to get on board with where this was going. Um, and it, as we talked about before, some quibble over terminology more than others. Hey, we can sign up for PVE, but we don't want a thing to do with CVE. Uh, what are the differences between those again? Um, uh, but I think at the end of the day, when we start talking about what we're what effects we're trying to have on the ground and what we're trying to prevent from happening, there's a fairly good consensus there. I also believe that the tent has gotten bigger uh, in some sense on other countries' contributions, um, certainly from the donor kind of food group, uh, uh, because I think, it again, it's more palatable for them to make contributions to that, and we're a little bit further away from some of the stigmas of Iraq and other things like that. And, and ISIS, I think, has shocked the system a little bit and created a new motivation to get behind that. And now, if anything, I feel like we're seeing more leadership, uh, and I think for this audience, hopefully there will be nodding, but more research that are coming from, uh, uh, whether it's European or other centers that are producing things that are quite helpful and informative for our approaches. So I do think that that has gotten bigger. There is a bit more of a coalition, and in some cases there are more resources available to work so, on it. So to follow up on that uh, resource, uh, I'm sorry, research is issue, not resources, we're going back to research. Um, well, a question from the audience uh, that I'll modify a little. What, any, um, any tips for uh, scholars uh, on what to do to uh, get in front of a policymaker, get your ideas in front of a policymaker, and how to make those ideas uh, user-friendly? I'll start, just two very simple things. Um, put the bottom line up front and don't be afraid to uh, be critical and to be directly critical. When I first arrived in government, one of my colleagues said, you know, you'll be amazed at how quickly offices take notice when someone mentions them directly. And that is definitely true. So, you know, you might not see the ripples, but people in government do read and take notes. I would just take those two things, you know, put the bottom line really up front because particularly senior people in organizations don't have time to read academic papers. They will not read to the end. They don't build to a conclusion. They want to know in a summary paragraph up front and if you have a critical comment and you frame it specifically you will definitely get the attention of you ever put in that comment uh, if I can just add to that um, I liked uh, the par presentation earlier to sort of remind folks you don't have to have spent the first three years of your graduate life figuring out your research question and then go out and solve the answer to just that probably come work with us and others and, and figure it out as you go. Just commit the time and the level of effort. Uh, and then I think a more iterative approach is a smarter approach for us. I think the, the, the fallacy of us knowing what the solutions were gonna be or what the, the problem was that we needed to research immediately way ahead of time is, is, is just not there. Um, uh, I, I saved this quote, I wanted to read this, but um, we received a very good piece of, of research recently it's 161 pages long, but it was good. Um, and, and the response from, from one of our senior leaders on the email chain was, excellent to have this kind of analysis. Now how to incorporate this into our programming. And I think that that last little step from research conclusions to actionability, I, I beg that, that researchers, especially those like you who are steeped in field work, just stagger a couple of guesses about where you would take this. Make some suggestions about actionability, not just, you know, here's what the regression tells us, but what would you actually think about doing as a result of this? Or what would you try to avoid? Uh, that type of stuff, I think, is very interesting. It helps us to kickstart the policy conversation internally as to how we would start um, developing interventions around it. Uh, I would just add, uh, agree with all that. I would add one other thing. For where I've been working and uh, at the State Department watching it over the years, nothing gets attention more than if a congressman says, I read this report, can you please, you know, why aren't you acting on this? Having that kind of political reach um, and just even a question will uh, get such an immediate response, it's incredible. I, I had one other thing I was gonna say, which was uh, I, I would encourage um, our academic uh, partners especially to follow policy. Read the documents that are coming out that are provocative towards policy. 
Uh, um, so, you know, USIP in partnership with this, um, you know, congressional task force, congressionally mandated task force put out the, the, uh, the extremism in, in, in fragile uh, environments uh, publication. It's a pretty provocative piece. It's got an annex with proposed legislation. I mean, that's, it, it, it's, it's out there. These are the types of debates that we're having internally uh, in the policy world, and I think the more you understand those, it will help you craft the, the sort of last few pages of some of your research to really be responsive to some of those challenges. What, what um, uh, if you can quantify, uh, what percentage of the research that does um, get a response, that does get uh, people's attention, comes in the form of not the monograph, but the, the four-pager that has been boiled down by a place like USIP or our many or the many resolve partners. I mean, is that uh, is that a word to the wise? Should you hook up with a with um, a, a policy institute to to uh, get it into the right format? Or um, yeah, I will. Yeah, the the center certainly does. Um, I'm going to give you um, a yes, but answer. Um, for reasons that have just been described, um, shorter is better than longer. If you want to get a policymaker or even the staff of a policymaker to read it, because their staffs are often even busier than the senior person is. Um, but there is peril here as well. It's not an unmitigated good. To, brevity is not an unmitigated good. Um, brevity can, you can lose, you can lose, lose the context of the research, you can lose important details. That's one form of peril. Another one, I'm gonna, I say with some trepidation, because I know there are researchers in the audience here, it is not my intent to offend you. If I do offend, I apologize up front. Uh, but there is a problem. Some of the shorter pieces that I see come across that purport themselves to be research, if you ask for the original documents and examine them, they, sometimes they do not exist. Uh, an even more dangerous case is when you actually get to some of the source materials, there are no, there's no footnotes, there's no empiricism to the analysis, nobody's ever tried to repeat the experiment and gotten the same results. And so I came to the conclusion that some of the stuff that gets tossed at policymakers, whether they be congressional members or people in government or people in the executive branch, frankly, it's just personal opinion or anecdote tarted up as research. And when it comes across as a really short piece, it's very hard to detect that unless you dive, unless you challenge where is the source material for this. So on, on the bureaucratics of the interface between uh, the research community and the government, uh, I got to the State Department and um, I had a lot of people reading classified intelligence. I didn't have anyone reading uh, research. Um, so I went out and I hired Will McCants. Um, and that took care of it for a while, and then he said, you know, I don't like government that much. Um, uh, uh, Daniel, you said you have someone in your office who's just reading uh, the research. W what, what are the, the other organizations doing? Well, I, you know, I can't speak for other organizations. I mean, there are people who are well plugged into the research community. Uh, we've, you know, I, I laugh when you mentioned Will because he was one of the people who brought me into government and then promptly left um, uh, about a month later. Uh, a reliable friend. But, no you know, we've benefited very much in our organization. And you can't just have a person who sits and reads research. And that's not how I want to characterize um, uh, our uh, 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 approach to this. You have to push it to the people doing the work. You have to make sure they read it. You know, uh, she does the great work of going out and interacting with the research community and following things, but that then goes to members of our, our, our teams. And this also 
is a very important function of leadership. Leadership needs to hold people accountable, make it clear that we care not just that you're following classified analysis, but that we expect that you will be looking at academic research. We expect you will be interacting with researchers. We expect when you present your programs, one of the pillars of justification will be citations of research. So that's something that has to come from management. So I would say it's much more, I think it's actually dangerous in some ways to assign some person and think you've checked a box. You need to integrate it and that has to come from the top down. Also, I would love to see going ahead a little bit more interaction between the practitioner community and researchers just so that we can talk to each other. It's not always apparent from the outside what is and is not possible in government. It is sometimes rather idiosyncratic internally what is and is not possible in government. And you can't assume that people understand this. There has to be dialogue about it. So I'd love to see, you know, you could create some review board of practitioners who could look at papers and say what's actionable or not. But, you know, more ways that we can interact with each other. Could I just, uh, at CSO, I, I have to say, it, it's, it's an impressive bureau. It's an impressive group of people. And I think per capita wise, we have more PhDs on our staff than any other bureau at the department. And that's a deliberate kind of approach. We are recruiting from the people out there who are doing the research, bringing them in and asking them, now apply it. So it forces a dialogue. It forces a conversation that is constantly being renewed by the intake of the workers that we're bringing in. And what happens in the big five-sided building on this on these issues? <laughs> in terms of the intake of, of research? Well, I doubt it will surprise you to know that the uh, most um, eager consumption in the military, whether it's the Pentagon or elsewhere, of research, research materials are those about weapons platforms, mobility platforms, you know, the next generation radar or what have you. Um, I'm not suggesting that there aren't parts of the military that, whose mission, their, their, their mission is central to either information operations or influence activities or messaging or even things like CVE. Um, but, um, but they suffer from the same, the same problems that I would argue everybody else suffers from. If, if this is not a priority, for the most senior people in the joint staff or OSD or the service chiefs, it's hard to get attention. Um, so there's, there's often a ceiling effect that very energetic, very, very talented people just can't get beyond. Perhaps more importantly though, um, the, uh, you know, there, there is an attitude to some degree, it's, 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 a, it's a reasonable attitude. To, come, to some degree, it's a, it's a bad attitude that, um, that the research that is most relevant to dealing with um, the topics that we've come here to discuss, that's, there's, there's a bad attitude in the military. This not our job. We don't care which is ridiculous given how many senior military commanders I've heard in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever I've been saying, well, you know, damn it, we went in there and we killed all the terrorists, but now they've come back. Who's preventing the next crew from arising and coming back? You know, where are the fill in the blank civilians? Um, you know, and without recognizing, well, you failed to pay attention to this n up until now, Oh, now it's goring your ox, so now you care. Reminds me of that really famous Rumsfeld snowflake. Are we, are they regenerating faster than we can kill them? The answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the uh, one of the secrets, uh, little little known secrets, at least from uh, a few years ago in in the government, was that DoD was often a surreptitious sort of funder of a lot of CVE that was going on at state, and DoD was a great partner in a lot of. Uh, three stars and four stars got it and wanted to help out the State Department. It will be interesting to see if that persists as there's some reorientation of priorities. The, well, it, it, I would argue it's in the long-term strategic interest of the U.S. military to become a stronger advocate of 
of the civilian practitioners, both government and non-governmental, that do the kind of work we're talking about here today. But at the end of the day, no amount of enthusiasm or even advocacy from the United States military is going to get this community to where it needs to be. The, 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 the kinds of resourcing and policy support that I would argue everybody uh, on this panel that are still in, uh, I'm the only one not in government now uh, of your panelists, um, the, the, what they need to truly strategically succeed cannot be funneled through the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is never going to care enough about this to, to make that successful. Without policymakers of all stripes becoming greater enthusiasts for this kind of work, which in many ways is more difficult and more complex than anything I've had to do, um, we're never going to get there. Okay, well, um, I think uh, uh, blood sugar levels are plunging. Uh, people are thinking about uh, what else they'd like to be doing uh, this evening. So I just wanted to ask if our panelists had any final thoughts on, on this um, eternally challenging set of problems that we've discussed. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's again, it's one of those problems of democracy. How do you get people to focus on the long term? How do you get them to fund things that are uncertain? Uh, how do you convince them that uh, you know we can develop greater knowledge? We have done it in the past in other circumstances. Um, I, if anyone has any closing thoughts on their own, uh, and you can anonymize your discussions on your own interactions with the Hill on this, uh, I would be eager to hear them because ultimately that institution is going to play uh, that part of our branch of our government is going to play a really big role in all this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think because this is being recorded, there will be little anonymization. But um, uh, uh, no, I mean, I think at least at least for me, uh, I sort of feel like a, a counterterrorist in a candy store um, to have an audience like this and people working on so many different issues that directly impact the way that we use, in many cases, your money. Um, and I think that the 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 one thing I was going to say. Um, uh, earlier that was, uh, I think, a positive point here is that the fundamentals uh, of, the, of the CVE, PVE space that we're working in have, have stayed. They've had durability through changes of administration, and, and that's good. That's good for all of us. Uh, if it had been even more of a, of a policy uh, 180, we would, we would have a, a lot of real problems. And I think we'd be that many more years behind. So because those fun fundamentals are there, I think we are making um, some, some progress. And I think we're doing it in a much more sophisticated way than we had previously. Uh, Cadre-wise, we still need to grow. Um, uh, you know, it was a pretty lonely conference room in the early days, and, and it is bigger, but, you know, that handful of people, unfortunately, several of whom are in the room here, uh, I don't all want riding on the same public transportation at the same time, just for fear of lobotomization of our capacity. Um, but but I, I, I do think that uh, there's also uh, uh, just extraordinary growth that still needs to happen in how we much more rapidly communicate <laughs> because if the threat is going to be changing this dynamically going forward we need actionable research much quicker and 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 i think that uh, that's true in the development space i think it's probably true in the diplomacy space and i and i i know that it's true on the security side as well let me just pick up from there because i would agree with that and i would say um, and the interactions we've been having on the Hill especially, there's a recognition that this is a field that is here to stay, and it has a future, and it has a, uh, a value and a worth that people are projecting to the future. So I believe, you know, we'll, there will be, uh, you know, waxing and waning of support through the years, but overall, this is now an area that people say, this is something we have to pay attention to and support politically, and that's the message we're getting from the Hill. And in general, as I mentioned before, we're seeing the policy space in this area expand and broaden in ways that are going into different fields and taking different approaches to the CVE problems. Um, but with generally bipartisan support and support both from the Hill and from the administration in ways that I still find sometimes astonishing in the current climate.
Yeah, let me just uh, offer my heartfelt thanks to the people in this room. I think that, you know, and, and all the other researchers out there, I think that much of the positive progress that has been made in this field, much more of it than is generally recognized, is really directly attributable to your insights, your field work. Um, uh, it's something that I think we see just in the fact that this forum is taking place, that Resolve exists, that we're having this uh, kind of an interchange. You know, I think it's a good model to build on, and I hope we build on it more. Well, I wasn't quite sure how I would end this on a positive note, but somehow it happened. <laughs> and uh, given all the other uh, elements of the discussion, I'm, I'm quite pleased with myself. So um, on that note, let me thank you all for your continued attention. Let me in particular thank our panelists for uh, an enlivening and informative discussion. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Leanne.